just only for the nation. A radical guy, it's time to make changes. Bringing interviews and radical education. Yeah, yeah, a better future, what we really need. Welcome to episode 24 of A Radical Podcast, folks. I'm your host, Jason Bayless, and today we're navigating through a rich panorama of ideas, struggles, and moments that come to life in the radical milieu. From the volatile zones of conflict to the energetic epicenters of urban protests, this episode aims to be a journey that will engage your mind and spirit. First up, in Anarchist and Radical News, we're featuring a special interview from It's Going Down, where we'll listen to members of FAUDA, a Palestinian anarchist group fighting on the front lines against systemic injustice and oppression. With their unique blend of education and direct action, FAUDA is shaping a legacy of resistance and change that you simply can't afford to overlook. But hold tight, because we're not stopping there. In our Resistance Around the World segment, we'll unpack the enigma and real-world impact of the Black Bloc tactic. If you've ever caught sight of black-clad figures in protest videos and pondered their identity or their principles, we'll clarify the backstory and aims of this iconic form of direct action. Later on, you'll also hear how you can become an active part of this struggle in our About a Radical Guide segment. This is more than a listening experience. It's a call to engagement and contribution. So brace yourselves for an illuminating voyage through the complexities and subtleties of global resistance and radical thought. Let's go. Today, we spotlight an invaluable piece from It's Going Down, entitled Voices from the Frontline Against the Occupation, Interview with Palestinian Anarchists. The article presents a compelling conversation between two activist collectives, the Black Rose Anarchist Federation in the United States and FAUDA, a Palestinian anarchist group actively resisting the fraught terrain of the West Bank. This interview bridges disparate landscapes of struggle, allowing us a more nuanced view of the mechanisms of resistance where the stakes are high and the challenges are manifold. Dialogues like this one serve as vital conduits for shared experiences and strategies, fostering a more unified approach to resistance across diverse political and geographical landscapes. They contribute to the global discourse of anarchism and resistance, weaving together narratives often fragmented or isolated due to geographical or political divides. The conversation becomes an act of internationalism, a cornerstone for building stronger, more effective alliances against shared enemies of oppression and systemic violence. In a landscape marked by complex political and ideological dynamics, Fauda carves out a unique space by advocating for anarchist principles. Their work revolves around fighting apartheid and systemic discrimination through a medley of activities. This includes the education of Palestinian youth on the tenets of anarchism and methods of resistance, organizing ground-level protests, and combating propaganda through the release of timely and factual information. Given the unbearable human conditions Palestinians face, such as indiscriminate arrests, crippling resource shortages, and broader issues related to human dignity, Fauda gives us an unvarnished look at life under occupation. But they don't stop at criticizing the Israeli state. They also lay bare the complicity of the Palestinian Authority. Fauda tells us that Mahmoud Abbas and his administration far from being representatives of the Palestinian people, have entered into security agreements that effectively assist Israel in repressing dissent within the occupied territories. If you're contemplating the effectiveness of nonviolent protest methods like general strikes, Fauda forces us to confront some uncomfortable truths. They argue that the scope for such avenues of resistance has reached a point of diminishing returns. The extremity of the situation calls for a diversity of tactics including armed resistance. Their stance underscores a sense of urgency, signaling that Palestinians must use every tool to challenge a system that aims to erode their existence and dignity. The skepticism extends even to the potential for ideological change within working-class Israeli society. Fauda expresses doubt about any substantial shift away from Zionism, highlighting the deeply ingrained settler colonial attitudes that make mutual recognition of freedom and equality a distant prospect. What we take away from this piece is not merely an inside view into the strategies and challenges faced by Palestinian anarchists like Fauda, but also a reflection on our own methods and commitments as activists. It's a call for international solidarity, pushing us to evaluate and recalibrate our own approaches, no matter where we are located on this globe. The fight against structures of oppression and injustice, after all, recognizes no boundaries. 
To read the full interview, please check the show notes for the link. A radical guide, that's what this is. Highlighting the diverse world of resistance. In today's segment of Resistance Around the World, we set our sights on a form of direct action that has paradoxically become both iconic and enigmatic, the Black Bloc. You've probably encountered the term in various media outlets, frequently accompanied by dramatic visuals. Individuals swathed in black attire, their faces obscured by masks or bandanas. While these images might be striking, they barely scratch the surface of what Black Bloc is, how it originated, and the role it plays in modern resistance movements. Today, we aim to demystify this tactic, revealing its historical roots, its tactical nuances, and the debates it sparks not just in mainstream media, but also among activists who are theoretically on the same side. So if you've ever found yourself puzzled, intrigued, or even skeptical about Black Bloc, stay with us. We'll be peeling back the layers on this complex and contentious strategy, scrutinizing its origins, its evolution, and its impact on social justice endeavors around the globe. The roots of the Black Bloc tactic can be traced back to a tumultuous period in Germany during the 1980s. This was a time of social unrest and political activism, marked by large-scale protests against nuclear power, the presence of NATO, and the emerging neo-Nazi movement. At the core of the Black Bloc's formation were the Autonomen, a loosely affiliated, anti-authoritarian, and anti-capitalist collective. Far from being a monolithic entity, the Autonomen comprised a variety of groups and individuals, each driven by a commitment to direct action and a disdain for bureaucratic, top-down activism. The Autonomen began deploying Black Bloc tactics as a pragmatic response to two urgent needs. Firstly, to counter the increasingly sophisticated police surveillance measures aimed at identifying and singling out activists, and secondly, to exert collective force in confrontations with far-right groups and during protests. Dressed uniformly in black and masked, activists found they could preserve their anonymity while maintaining a visual and physical solidarity that made it difficult for authorities to target individuals. As the tactic gained traction in Germany, it began to be adopted in other parts of Europe. By the late 1990s, it had made its way across the Atlantic to North America, marking its presence in protests against corporate globalization and trade agreements. One of its most prominent appearances was at the Battle of Seattle in 1999, where it played a significant role in protests against the World Trade Organization. Here, the Black Bloc drew attention not only for its confrontations with the police, but also for its strategic property damage, targeting corporate storefronts and outlets viewed as symbols of capitalist exploitation. Fast forward to the 21st century, and we find the Black Bloc tactic expanding its geographical and ideological scope. The tactic saw use in the anti-globalization demonstrations in Genoa, Italy, in 2001, which resulted in a strong police crackdown. It also played a role in the Arab Spring uprisings, particularly in Egypt, where it was employed to protect protesters from both state and non-state aggressors. Throughout its evolution, the Black Bloc has consistently materialized at critical flashpoints of social and political unrest, be it combating far-right movements in Europe, or resisting authoritarian regimes during the Arab Spring. The tactic adapts itself to the particular struggles and needs of diverse movements, yet remains rooted in its foundational principles of anonymity, collective action, and direct confrontation. Now let's explore the international faces of Black Bloc. One of the intriguing aspects of Black Bloc is its global resonance. Rooted in the squatter scenes and autonomous movements of 1980s Germany, the tactic has found its way into an array of different social and political landscapes worldwide. This adaptability ensures that while the core principle of anonymized collective direct action remains stable, the methods and targets are ever fluid, molded by the specific contours of local struggles. The term Black Bloc is said to have originated in the German autonomous movement of the late 20th century. However, it would be a mistake to think of it as just a German or European phenomenon. The tactic was quickly adopted and modified by Antifa groups and has since become an integral part of diverse global movements, from the anti-globalization protests in Seattle in 1999 to contemporary demonstrations against authoritarian regimes. Over the years, Black Bloc tactics have been employed in protests against various summits of world leaders like the G8 and the G20. These instances often center on global issues, be it climate change, economic inequality, or imperialist policies, 
making the Black Bloc's presence at such gatherings a pointed critique against global power structures. The Arab Spring offers an insightful case study into the global adaptability of Black Bloc tactics. Activists during Egypt's 2011 revolution adapted these tactics not just to guard against state violence, but also to protect their identities from regime-sanctioned retribution. While they may not have explicitly identified with Black Bloc, the principles were fundamentally similar. Collective action, anonymity, and direct confrontation with oppressive state apparatus. The Hong Kong protests against the extradition bill and subsequently for democratic freedoms showcased another innovative usage of black bloc tactics. Activists in Hong Kong made extensive use of technology, encrypted communication, and even lasers to disrupt facial recognition cameras. These adaptations speak to the dynamic nature of black bloc, constantly evolving to meet the specific challenges and technologies deployed against them. In France, the Gilet Jaune or Yellow Vest movement also saw the presence of Black Bloc activists. Here, the focus was largely on socioeconomic issues like tax reforms and income inequality. The Black Bloc activists within these protests aimed to bring attention to these issues through direct action, sometimes in the form of economic sabotage or confrontations with law enforcement. The utilization of Black Bloc tactics in Latin American protests, especially in countries like Chile and Brazil, resonates with the continent's long history of resistance against authoritarianism and imperialism. The Black Bloc serves as both a symbolic and functional element in a larger tapestry of opposition movements, many of which are rooted in combating economic exploitation and social injustice. It's worth noting that globally, the Black Bloc strategy often merges with other forms of resistance. For instance, feminist collectives have utilized black bloc tactics during Women's Day protests, emphasizing the need for anonymity due to potential social stigmatization or retaliation, adding an intersectional lens to the tactic. As we peel back the layers on the tactical realm of black bloc, we see an intricate global tapestry woven from diverse strands of resistance. Whether you're looking at protests against authoritarian regimes in the Arab Spring, or the Long March for Democratic Freedoms in Hong Kong, or the socioeconomic struggles highlighted by the Yellow Vests in France, the application and evolution of Black Bloc tactics manifest differently, yet significantly, in each setting. When we engage in the discourse about the Black Bloc as a tactic in various protest movements, we often encounter the duality of their role as a shield and a sword. This duality is far from one-dimensional, encompassing a rich tapestry of strategies tailored to different sociopolitical landscapes. The role of the Black Bloc as a shield is not just a surface-level strategy. It's multi-layered, adaptive, and geared towards both immediate and long-term consequences. It aims to protect activists from the immediate threats of state intervention, such as arrests and violent suppression, as well as longer-term hazards like legal actions and doxing. But beyond serving as a method for dodging immediate threats, the SHIELD strategy is proactive, necessitating a high level of planning and coordination. This form of collective anonymity also serves as a form of collective protection, forming a unified, indistinguishable mass against exterior forces. It's not merely about blending into a sea of black attire. In the context of Egypt's Arab Spring or the protests in Hong Kong, this shield strategy activated multiple dimensions to protect against state retaliation and sophisticated surveillance technologies. In Hong Kong, for instance, activists expanded their toolkit to include umbrellas, laser pointers, and paint, aiming to disable facial recognition cameras. The Black Bloc shield is more than a tactical buffer. It's a manifestation of solidarity and collective action. In forming human barriers or even makeshift barricades, as seen in Egypt, the shield serves as both a physical and symbolic barrier against state forces, ensuring individual security amid collective action. Contrasting with the defensive shield, the sword aspect of the Black Bloc is assertive and outward-looking. It aims to confront and subvert oppressive systems directly. Importantly, the sword is not synonymous with violence. From graffiti and occupation of space to industrial sabotage and hacktivism, the sword tactic embraces a gamut of activities designed to disrupt oppressive systems. For instance, in the realm of community defense, Black Bloc activists may form human barriers against oppressive groups, taking the sword function beyond mere defense and into the realm of active resistance. The disabling of machinery or defacement of corporate billboards are acts that serve as economic sabotage, adding a financial cost to oppressive systems. 
Such actions challenge the principles of capitalist accumulation and control, making oppression increasingly expensive for the oppressors. It's crucial to underline that these dual roles are not static. They are continually being adapted and redefined according to the concept of the shield and the sword. Whether in Seattle during the 1999 WTO protests, Hong Kong, Egypt during the Arab Spring, or Latin America, each geographical area and socio-political landscape demands its own unique adaptation of these basic principles. For example, in Latin America, the sword has been directed against symbols of economic exploitation, including international corporations and banks. Such localized adaptations are all aimed at the larger goal of creating spaces of resistance and opportunities for systemic change. The Black Bloc's enduring relevance lies in its multifaceted approach to activism, its robust adaptability, and the harmony between its defensive and offensive operations. The roles of shield and sword don't merely exist in a vacuum. They are interdependent strategies in a complex dance of defense and confrontation. Through a dynamic interplay of these dual roles, the Black Bloc tactic continues to serve as a powerful means of challenging oppressive systems and creating the possibility for genuine change. Discussing the tactics and roles of Black Bloc without exploring the guiding principles that inform them would be an incomplete analysis. These principles are not just theoretical, but are deeply rooted in the practice of resistance, functioning as the ethical and ideological bedrock upon which tactical choices and roles are constructed. Here, we'll examine some of the core principles that energize and guide Black Bloc activism. The principle of anonymity is not just a tactical choice, but a form of empowerment. It rejects the notion that resistance should be personalized or commodified, focusing instead on collective action. In doing so, it subverts traditional power dynamics that often isolate and target individuals, allowing for a more robust and resilient form of resistance. For example, anonymity is crucial for avoiding targeted harassment or legal repercussions in settings where state-sanctioned surveillance is extensive, such as the 2019-2020 Hong Kong protests. As seen in the G20 protests in Toronto, the collective focus keeps the spotlight on the issues rather than individual activists, countering the celebrity culture that can dilute a movement's aims. Anonymity also empowers participants to engage in riskier actions. During anti-austerity protests in Greece, activists used masks not just for identity protection, but to enable direct actions like economic sabotage, which could have legal consequences. In addition, this principle extends its protective umbrella to marginalized communities. LGBTQ plus activists in countries where homosexuality is criminalized have used black bloc tactics to protest without revealing their identities. Lastly, the principle of anonymity broadens participation by creating a space where one's social or economic status, ethnicity, or other identifying factors don't overshadow the collective aim of the protest. In these various ways, the principle of anonymity transcends its role as a mere tactic. It is deeply intertwined with the empowering potential of collective action. It not only allows participants to escape potential retribution, but also strengthens the fabric of the movement by rejecting the limitations of individualism and embracing the power of the collective. Black Bloc operates under a decentralized framework that prioritizes individual autonomy within a collective context. This is antithetical to hierarchical systems of governance and control. Every participant is empowered to contribute, decide, and act which makes the whole structure more dynamic and less susceptible to being dismantled or infiltrated. During the protests against the World Trade Organization in Seattle in 1999, the decentralization principle was evident as small affinity groups were able to act independently while still contributing to the larger goal of the protest. This allowed for simultaneous actions across the city, from sit-ins blocking traffic to banner drops and direct actions targeting corporations, all without a single, identifiable leader that could be arrested or delegitimized. During the G20 protests in various countries, Black Bloc activists utilized a decentralized approach to maximize their impact. Individual activists or small groups engaged in independent actions like economic sabotage, banner drops, and blockades without requiring approval from a centralized command structure. This strategy created a fluid and adaptive form of protest that made it challenging for law enforcement agencies to anticipate moves, leading to a more effective and robust collective action. 
In the context of the Yellow Vest movement in France, the principle of decentralization allowed for broad participation across socioeconomic statuses and political leanings. Without a central organizing committee, people felt empowered to take to the streets, set up blockades, and participate in direct actions, all according to their comfort level and ideological bent. Similarly, in the Black Lives Matter protests, the autonomy granted to activists allowed for a multi-pronged approach to fighting systemic racism. From removing Confederate statues to community organizing and defunding the police initiatives, decentralization made it difficult for authorities to pin down a single agenda or group of leaders to vilify or negotiate with, thus maintaining the movement's momentum and reach. This approach allows Black Bloc to rapidly adapt to different political and social environments, whether resisting authoritarian regimes, fighting economic exploitation, or confronting various forms of systemic oppression. The principle of decentralization isn't just a tactical consideration, but a fundamental aspect of Black Bloc's ideology. It underscores the importance of individual agency in collective resistance, reflecting a broader political ethos that stands in stark contrast to authoritarian and hierarchical systems. A cornerstone of Black Bloc strategy is the principle of solidarity and mutual aid. This is not just an adjunct to confrontation. It's an essential ideological feature that meshes seamlessly with broader radical and anarchist traditions of community and mutual reliance. It's crucial to ground this principle with tangible instances where Black Bloc activists have manifested this ethos in real world scenarios. In a particularly poignant example from 2017, when white supremacists marched in Virginia, attempting to attack Black clergy and movement leaders, Black Bloc participants acted as a protective shield. Cornell West, who was one of those at risk, said, the next day, for example, those 20 of us who were standing, many of them clergy, we would have been crushed like cockroaches if it were not for the anarchists and the anti-fascists. The anti-fascists, and then, crucial, the anarchists, because they saved our lives, actually. This wasn't just about confrontation. It was about standing in solidarity, offering real-time protection to those most vulnerable to the vitriol and violence of white supremacists. In Greece, particularly during the anti-austerity protests, Black Bloc activists played a dual role. They confronted riot police, but also facilitated grassroots medical assistance for those injured in clashes. Further, they were part of networks distributing food and clothing to people severely affected by austerity measures, a crucial demonstration of solidarity within a society in crisis. In the ongoing protests against the anti-extradition bill in Hong Kong, Black Bloc activists have been seen handing out water bottles and umbrellas to shield protesters from tear gas and surveillance cameras. These might appear like small gestures, but they are vital forms of mutual aid that reinforce the collective spirit of the movement. In Brazil, Black Bloc activists took part in protests against public transport fare hikes and governmental corruption. They not only confronted police, but also distributed leaflets to educate the public about the issues they were protesting. These moments serve to build solidarity by informing and involving people who might otherwise remain disengaged. In Chile, during the social uprising that started in 2019, Black Bloc was proactive in defending indigenous Mapuche communities against state violence. Activists helped form human shields to protect these communities. This was combined with material support, such as distributing supplies and offering legal aid, thereby epitomizing the dual roles of shield and sword in a context-specific manner. Through these examples, the roles of shield and sword and Black Bloc strategy reveal themselves not as isolated tactics, but as intertwined elements of a broader philosophy. Whether in Virginia, Greece, Hong Kong, Brazil, or Chile, the dual roles of shield and sword are consistently adapted to meet the unique needs of particular movements and protests. This creates a multifaceted approach to activism encompassing defense, offense, and mutual aid, all aimed at confronting diverse forms of oppression while forging spaces of resistance and opportunities for systemic change. While Black Bloc has been widely associated with the idea of direct action, the crux of its tactical playbook actually lies in what can be termed as confrontational politics. This should not be misconstrued as gratuitous disruption for its own sake. Rather, it serves as a precise and calculated tactic aimed at confronting systems of oppression, be they economic, social, or political, in direct and unambiguous terms. 
Now, why does confrontational politics emerge as a core strategy? It often comes to the forefront as a considered response to the inadequacies or even failures of traditional or accepted forms of protest. Think about it. There are moments when peaceful marches don't get past the news cycle, petitions are forgotten in the corridors of power, and dialogues end up as mere talking shops without tangible outcomes. When these avenues have been exhausted or ignored, and the machinery of systemic oppression grinds on, that's when Black Bloc activists resort to confrontational politics. Here, it acts not as an opening gambit, but as a consequential, sometimes inevitable, tactic for elevating marginalized voices and instigating substantive change. In using confrontational politics, Black Bloc activists engage in targeted actions that are deeply tied to the specific issues they are opposing. They're not just challenging an isolated incident or a singular entity. They're taking on the systemic structures that perpetuate inequities and injustices. For instance, when targeting corporations known for exploitative labor practices, the objective is not merely to deface property, but to force a public reckoning with the moral and ethical underpinnings of a system that allows such exploitation to persist. Moreover, confrontational politics is about claiming or reclaiming spaces, be they physical, social, or discursive, from which marginalized communities have been excluded. It's about pushing back against a hegemonic narrative that often goes unchallenged and setting the stage for more expansive conversations and actions aimed at social justice. One cannot overlook the communal aspect of confrontational politics either. The act of confronting oppressive systems collectively serves not just as a manifestation of communal defiance, but also engenders a sense of solidarity among activists. This collective ethos is what gives the tactic its potency, ensuring that it's not just an individual crying out in the wilderness, but a coordinated chorus demanding change. So, while confrontational politics can certainly be dramatic and perhaps unsettling to some, its role within the context of black bloc strategy is a complex and nuanced one. It is not a tactic of mere chaos, but one of necessity and urgency aimed at forcing open doors that have been closed to dialogues and actions that could pave the way for a more equitable society. In this light, confrontational politics serves as a vital tool in the Black Bloc's tactical arsenal, a method that is as intellectually rigorous as it is physically daring, geared not just to disrupt but to interrogate, challenge, and ultimately transform systems of oppression. Black Bloc's commitment to non-hierarchical forms of participation facilitates a space where all voices are considered valuable, rather than having a few dominate the conversation. This embodies the broader political ethos that Black Bloc encapsulates, which is fundamentally anti-authoritarian and participatory in nature. Non-hierarchical participation refers to a mode of engagement and organization in which all participants are viewed as equally valuable contributors to the cause without a fixed or formal leadership structure. Decisions are made collectively, often through consensus-based methods, and each individual is empowered to contribute their skills, opinions, and actions to the group's efforts. This structure is deliberately designed to be anti-authoritarian, fostering a sense of shared responsibility and minimizing the risks of power imbalances or exploitation within the group. In the Quebec City protests against the free trade area of the Americas in 2001, Black Bloc activists operated in a non-hierarchical manner, emphasizing consensus decision-making. Activists organized through affinity groups and spontaneous assemblies where strategies and tactics were collectively discussed and agreed upon. This collective decision-making was aimed at giving every participant an equal voice, thereby resisting traditional power dynamics often found in more centralized organizations. During the Occupy Wall Street movement, Black Bloc activists were among those who practiced non-hierarchical participation through the use of general assemblies. These open meetings were spaces where anyone could propose an action, tactic, or policy, and these would be openly debated and decided upon by the group at large. The assembly operated on consensus, meaning each voice was important and unilateral decisions were avoided. In Germany, black bloc groups have often organized under the umbrella of larger coalitions against far-right extremism. Here, too, their non-hierarchical structures come into play. Planning meetings involve individuals from various groups and political affiliations, each contributing to a shared tactical and strategic vision without a commanding authority dictating terms. During the anti-globalization protests in Prague in 2000, Black Bloc participants utilized non-hierarchical structures in the form of spokes councils. 
These were decision-making bodies composed of representatives from various affinity groups, each of which operated non-hierarchically internally. The Spokes Council then served as a way to coordinate larger actions without imposing a top-down structure. In the Tahrir Square protests in Egypt in 2011, Black Bloc emerged as an entity that was open to anyone who adhered to its basic principles. This openness, devoid of a screening hierarchy, allowed for a rapid influx of participants, making it a significant force in the anti-authoritarian uprisings. Their presence was not dictated by a leadership, but was a voluntary association of like-minded individuals. The J-20 protests against the inauguration of Donald Trump in 2017 also saw Black Bloc activists operating in a non-hierarchical fashion. Prior to the protests, activists organized through horizontal networks, shared documents, and encrypted chats to decide on tactics and messaging, ensuring that every participant could contribute to shaping the action's direction. In Australia, during protests against the treatment of asylum seekers, Black Bloc activists, along with other groups, emphasized non-hierarchical participation through collective forums and social media platforms, allowing for input from individuals who might not be able to physically attend meetings or protests. This demonstrated an application of non-hierarchical principles, even in the planning phase. One of the foundational tenets of Black Bloc is the profound recognition that oppression is a shifting, morphing beast. Oppression does not remain constant. It's often reinvented, adapted, and recalibrated by the systems that deploy it. Consequently, the counter strategies to resist such oppression must inherently embody flexibility, nimbleness, and above all, adaptability. When we talk about adaptability, we're speaking to a sort of intellectual agility, an openness to reevaluate and reformulate tactics in real time, a commitment to situational awareness that allows for a recalibration of actions based on the specific challenges at hand. Unlike rigid ideological systems that propose a one-size-fits-all approach to resistance, the Black Bloc ethos is deeply rooted in a kind of tactical pluralism. This pluralism not only welcomes but insists upon the need for diverse methods of resistance, finely tuned to the unique demands of the moment. You see, adaptability isn't a last-minute resort but a preemptive strategy. It's the backbone of a more responsive, efficient, and ultimately more effective form of activism. Black Bloc activists don't just adapt for adaptation's sake. They adapt as a logical and necessary response to the ever-changing theaters of oppression they engage with. Whether it's countering advancements in surveillance technology, adapting to geographic challenges, or responding to a shifting public sentiment, the principle of adaptability serves as both shield and sword in the ongoing struggle against oppression. Adaptability is also closely intertwined with the concept of fluidity. This fluidity isn't simply about changing locations or outfits to blend in. It's about the fluidity of thought, the flexibility of method, and the versatility of action. Fluidity allows Black Bloc activists to operate in a range of contexts, from urban to rural, from peaceful demonstrations to confrontational politics, without losing their effectiveness or diluting their message. Furthermore, adaptability reinforces the collective strength of the group. A collective that can adapt is far less likely to be neutralized than a collective that is rigid or predictable. By being adaptive, Black Bloc can weather not only the physical but also the intellectual and ideological attacks that are frequently launched against it. This makes the collective resilient, resourceful, and more capable of sustaining long-term efforts against complex, adaptive systems of control. To encapsulate, adaptability is an ethos a worldview that is deeply embedded in the DNA of Black Bloc activism. It is a form of intellectual rigor, a commitment to continuously interrogate and innovate methods of resistance to meet the evolving challenges of systemic oppression. Far from being a mere tactical choice, adaptability is a profound statement about the nature of resistance itself. As dynamic, as multifaceted, and as complex as the systems it seeks to dismantle. The ethical commitment to justice serves as the bedrock of Black Bloc's various activities. This commitment isn't merely a banner they wave, but the lens through which they view the world. While the strategies employed might be multifaceted and ever-changing, the end goal is unambiguous, the eradication of oppressive systems and the championing of a fairer society. In various global events, this commitment has been crystal clear. For instance, during the 2014 Ferguson Uprising, Black Bloc members lent their voices to amplify the struggles of marginalized communities, emphasizing the need for racial justice. 
In the Dakota Access Pipeline protests, they displayed a commitment to environmental justice and indigenous rights. During the COVID-19 pandemic, some even shifted their focus to mutual aid, such as food distribution and medical supplies, to meet immediate needs while upholding their longer-term vision of social justice. This unshakable ethical center serves as both an anchor and a compass for Black Bloc. It grounds their diverse tactics and strategies in a coherent moral framework while also offering direction for future action. It's this symbiosis between an enduring ethical commitment and agile tactics that give Black Bloc its potency and resilience. Without this ethical center, the group would lose its gravitational pull, becoming just another array of tactics without a unifying purpose. To understand Black Bloc, then, is to understand the interplay between these central tenets. Adaptability ensures they remain effective and relevant, while an ethical commitment to justice provides the why behind the what and how of their actions. Together, these principles offer a robust and dynamic framework for activism, making Black Bloc a significant force in contemporary resistance movements. Black Bloc's efficacy is not confined to anarchist or anti-globalization circles. This set of tactics, designed for anonymity, collective action, and direct confrontation, has been adopted and customized by a variety of social justice movements. Beyond its adaptability lies its intersectional resonance, an understanding that societal issues are interconnected and cannot be viewed in isolation. Take, for example, the evolution of variations like the pink block, clown block, or even the green block within environmental activism. These are more than aesthetic modifications. They are tactical iterations that incorporate specific themes or focuses. The pink block, often seen in LGBTQ plus and feminist protests, is not just a color-coded version of the black block, but often incorporates elements of performance and satire to challenge heteronormative societal structures. Feminist movements worldwide also provide compelling evidence of black bloc's broader appeal. Activists adopting these tactics can secure a layer of protection against both institutional opposition and societal stigmatization. By incorporating the core tenets of anonymity and collective action, feminist collectives and other intersectional movements can engage in protests and direct actions with a shield against identification and persecution. Such variations are not merely aesthetic, but serve to adjust the core tactics of anonymity, collective action, and direct action to fit unique objectives threats, or thematic focuses. Intersectional activists employing these modified tactics can add layers of complexity, security, and efficacy to their actions, making each block iteration a nuanced strategy in its own right. Moreover, intersectional movements often contribute their innovations to the evolving black block toolkit. In feminist adaptations, for instance, strategies might be modified to specifically counteract gendered forms of violence or harassment. This reciprocal relationship ensures that Black Bloc tactics remain dynamic, responsive, and perpetually relevant. Black Bloc's foundational elements, such as anonymity, collective action, and direct confrontation, are in a state of ceaseless evolution, a testament to its resilience and tactical flexibility. What distinguishes this set of strategies is its capacity to adapt to the ever-changing conditions of local and global struggles. Black Bloc is not monolithic, its tactics are continually molded by the circumstances of specific movements, geopolitical realities, and advancements in technologies for both activism and surveillance. Consider the ways in which activists in various parts of the world have adapted to increasing state capabilities for monitoring and control. In some instances, protesters have integrated blockchain technology into their strategies for secure and anonymous coordination. Others have developed innovative countermeasures against drone surveillance or devised ways to disrupt facial recognition technologies, as seen in Hong Kong's protests. The global Black Bloc community isn't just responsive but anticipatory. It operates with an awareness of the global rise of authoritarianism, increased policing, and surveillance, thereby always seeking out innovative ways to protect activists and confront systemic oppression. The activist collective doesn't just adapt in reaction to new forms of repression. It innovates proactively, creating alternative tactics that are steps ahead of the curve. For instance, there's an emergent focus on digital self-defense, encompassing encrypted communication and secure data storage, which allows activists to coordinate actions and disseminate information without the immediate threat of state intervention. Such advances aren't just useful for Black Bloc. 
They contribute to the broader ecosystem of social justice movements, offering newly developed best practices that can be adopted by other forms of activism. It's also crucial to recognize how these evolving tactics are shared within the global activist community. Knowledge transfer occurs through multiple channels, be it social media, activist forums, or direct training sessions, ensuring that successful strategies are disseminated and adopted across different movements and geographies. This continuous cycle of innovation, testing, and knowledge sharing serves to keep Black Bloc strategies versatile, robust, and effective, even as challenges escalate on a global scale. The tactics malleability is not an auxiliary feature, but a core attribute. Black Bloc's continuous evolution is an imperative driven by the ever-changing landscapes of resistance and repression. As oppressive systems worldwide become more sophisticated, the methods to resist them must evolve in tandem. Therefore, the global Black Bloc community remains perpetually committed to tactical evolution, a commitment that not only ensures its survival, but strengthens its efficacy in challenging diverse forms of oppression worldwide. The Black Bloc tactic set operates under the philosophy that the tools of resistance must be as dynamic as the systems they oppose. This perspective solidifies its role as an essential asset in the arsenal of global activism, ready to adapt, innovate, and confront the evolving challenges of our time. Black Bloc's relevance in today's world of surging inequality, police brutality, and authoritarian governance cannot be overstated. What was once considered an alternative or fringe form of protest has gained mainstream relevance, particularly as traditional forms of civil disobedience have, in many cases, proven to be less effective in achieving substantial change. Whether we're talking about income inequality, racial injustice, or oppressive regimes, Black Bloc tactics have evolved to meet the modern challenges presented by these systemic issues. In an era where your smartphone is a double-edged sword, providing the capability for instantaneous communication, but also serving as a tracking device, the adaptation of Black Bloc tactics to a digital landscape is crucial. The ubiquity of smartphones has introduced a new set of complications, but also a range of opportunities. For instance, encrypted messaging apps allow for secure coordination during protests, while also offering the risk of geolocation tracking if not properly managed. It's a tightrope that activists are learning to walk with greater finesse. Furthermore, let's not underestimate the scale and scope of today's surveillance technologies. Facial recognition software is increasingly sophisticated, able to identify individuals even in crowded settings or from challenging angles. This has necessitated inventive countermeasures, such as the use of lasers to disable surveillance cameras or sophisticated face coverings and paint that can thwart identification algorithms. What we're witnessing is a constant game of cat and mouse, where the tools of oppression and the strategies of resistance are in a relentless dance of adaptation and counter-adaptation. The state's investment in advanced policing technologies, from drones to predictive policing algorithms, has posed new challenges but also spurred creative forms of resistance. Whether it's finding ways to disable drone cameras or using decentralized networks to coordinate actions that are less predictable to the algorithmic gaze of the authorities, Black Bloc participants are constantly thinking several moves ahead in this complex chessboard of modern activism. The driving philosophy remains steadfast. Confront and disrupt oppressive systems while protecting the anonymity and safety of activists. But the tactics are agile, molded by the imperatives of modernity. No longer is it just about physical confrontation or even economic disruption. It's about understanding and circumventing the digital architecture of surveillance and control that sustains modern forms of inequality and oppression. Black Bloc has indeed modernized, but it hasn't compromised on its core principles. Instead, it has integrated new technologies and strategies to meet the contemporary challenges head on. In closing out this section, what emerges is a vivid tapestry of resistance that weaves together various elements of Black Bloc's tactical genius. Its adaptability, visual resonance, intersectional appeal, and continuous evolution. These elements don't exist in isolation, but function as interconnected gears in a well-calibrated machine designed for sustained resistance against myriad forms of systemic oppression. Black Bloc is not a static form of protest. It's a dynamic phenomenon that adjusts to the contours of each particular struggle it engages with. 
from the streets of Cairo to Seattle, from the anti-globalization protests to feminist collectives, its adaptive strategies have proven instrumental in challenging both traditional and modern forms of injustice and exploitation. With the growing sophistication of state surveillance and policing tools, Black Bloc remains vigilant in its continuous tactical evolution. Whether employing blockchain technology for secure communication or creating new strategies to combat drone surveillance, this form of activism is keenly aware of the shifting landscape of control and resistance. It's a living, breathing, and constantly adapting entity. Moreover, its aesthetic power, the arresting visual of a sea of black-clad individuals, provides a compelling narrative that commands attention. It signals the urgency of the struggle and presents a unified front against oppression making it difficult for the media and onlookers to ignore its impact. The utility of Black Bloc's tactics also extends to various social justice initiatives, illustrating its intersectional resonance. Feminist collectives, LGBTQ plus groups, and others have adopted its protective and confrontational strategies, finding common cause in the need for anonymity and collective action. To cap it off, the advent of new digital technologies and increasingly sophisticated surveillance methods has compelled Black Bloc to innovate and adapt continuously. In a world where the status quo is often fortified by technological advancements and state control, the enduring effectiveness of Black Bloc is a testament to the resilience, creativity, and unyielding commitment of activists who operate within this framework. Black Bloc serves as a compelling example of modern resistance, committed to challenging oppressive systems through an ever-evolving array of tactics that captivate, protect, confront, and inspire. It's not just a strategy for today, but a blueprint for engaged activism in the continually shifting landscapes of tomorrow. It's a radical education, yeah, yeah, a better future, what we really need, not rooted in capitalism or supremacy. In today's About a Radical Guide segment, we've got some important updates and ways you can get involved. First off, if you're familiar with the places that matter in your local struggle, whether it's a historical site of resistance, an organizing center, or even a bookstore where revolutionary ideas are exchanged, go ahead and add that to our online directory. It's not just a list. It's a living map of global activism. By contributing to it, you help us all see the wider landscape of resistance, and you're empowering others to find and connect with meaningful spaces. Now, if you're a fan of our multimedia content, you'll be excited to know that we've expanded our reach. Yes, we are everywhere you look. You can now catch all our videos, interviews, audiobooks, and podcasts, not only on our website, but also through our dedicated Roku and Fire TV channels. If you're more of an audiovisual person, don't forget to check out our YouTube channel. In addition to our digital presence, we've made a splash in the physical world too. If you've been around town lately, you may have spotted one of a Radical Guide's billboards. Emblazoned with the message, follow ideas, not people, these billboards encapsulate the ethos we strive to promote, a focus on the principles and actions that drive change rather than idolizing individual figures. The billboards are popping up in various locations worldwide, and they're not just for show. They're a call to rethink how we engage with the world of ideas and activism. Here's the exciting part. If you'd love to see one of these billboards in your town, reach out to us. We're open to expanding this project. And with your help, we could bring this potent message to even more communities. A billboard in your area could serve as a local rallying point, a source of inspiration, or a conversation starter for those who might not be exposed to radical thought. For our podcast enthusiasts, you're not left out. You can listen to episodes of a radical podcast on a multitude of platforms. Whether you're an Amazon Music subscriber, a Google Podcast aficionado, or you use Spotify, Apple Podcasts, CastBox, or iHeartRadio, we're there. No matter your platform, you can plug in and get the latest discussions right into your ears. Last but not least, as you can imagine, operating a platform this comprehensive takes resources. If you appreciate the work we're doing, believe in the mission, and want to see more of it, consider supporting us financially. Your contributions ensure that we can continue this important work, providing platforms for unheard voices and sharing tools for effective activism. So if you've ever thought, I want to help, now's your chance. Head to eradicalguide.com to find out how you can contribute to keeping this revolutionary project alive. Let's go. As we draw the curtain on another episode, let's reflect on what we've woven together today. We ventured from the embattled streets of the West Bank to dissect the philosophy and real-world applications of Fauda's anarchist principles. 
Then we pivoted our focus to examine the Black Bloc, a tactic that embodies the very essence of direct action and subversion. It serves as a mirror, reflecting the urgency and commitment that shape resistance movements globally. In the mosaic of resistance we've explored today, each of you plays an indispensable role. When you contribute a new location to our directory, you're making more than a mere digital imprint. You're amplifying voices that yearn to resonate in the collective consciousness. And when you tune in to our content across platforms, you're part of a continuous dynamic exchange of ideas that extends far beyond the reach of this episode. Your financial backing doesn't just support us. It powers the dialogues and actions that propel us all toward a more equitable world. We are collectively sowing the seeds of change, each in our own unique way. So, what does this mean for you? It means that you are not alone. Each step you take towards understanding, activism, and resistance is a step taken by the community at large. It also means that your voice matters, whether you're speaking through a megaphone in a protest or contributing to our platform. And don't forget, if you happen to pass by one of our billboards, snap a picture and send it to us. Not only will you receive a token of our appreciation, but you'll also become part of a visual testament to our collective ethos. Our struggle against systems that dehumanize and divide us has never been more critical, and our unity has never been more vital. Let's carry the conversations, learnings, and calls to action from today's episode forward as we continue to fight for a world worth inheriting. Thank you for investing your time and energy with us today. Until we meet again, be safe, be conscious, and be relentless in your pursuit of justice. Yeah, talking freedom and liberation. Worldwide, not just only for the nation. A radical guide, it's time to make changes. Bringing interviews and radical education. Yeah, yeah, a better future, what we really need. Not rooted in capitalism or supremacy. Yeah, yeah, trust, you don't want to miss it. We bring the truth right to you. The past, present, and future, let's go. A radical guide, that's what this is. Highlighting the diverse world of resistance. Let's go. 